We often distinguish humans from animals as if humans weren't animals, as if they fell into a different category or a different kind of being. But humans are animals, and so I use the term, and many others in this field use the term non-human animal to refer to those animals that are not human. It's an incredibly challenging problem understanding non-human animal minds because they can't tell us what they think or feel, and often their brains and bodies are structured very differently from humans. What non-human animals feel and think is very important for how we uh, treat them and the kind of protections they receive. To give one example of this, there's been a lot of discussion recently about whether some non-human animals, such as chimpanzees, should be given um, the status of persons. Chimpanzees can form goals and execute a plan in order to fulfill that goal. They also plan for the future in the sense of, uh, for example, picking the right tool that they'll need later on to uh, fulfill a, a task or solve a problem. They are also socially very sophisticated uh, um, they understand the goals and intentions of other agents and also can distinguish whether a partner, uh, for example, is being unwilling or unable with, uh, to cooperate. Because of all these abilities, um, philosophers and scientists have argued that chimpanzees should be understood as legal persons. They act autonomously in the world and thus are not things. One of the major limitations of the standard approaches for studying non-human animal intelligence is that non-human animals are compared with humans. You can think of this limitation in terms of a bias um, called the streetlight effect. Uh, this is an observational bias, and the anecdote associated with this bias is that you come across somebody who's looking for their keys under a street lamp, and you help them look for their keys under the street lamp, and then you ask them when you can't find the keys whether they're sure they lost them here, and they reply, no, I lost them elsewhere, um, but I'm looking here because this is where the light is. And one can uh, think of the current approach to studying non-human animal intelligence in a similar way. Um, so the street light here is human intelligence and we're understanding animals um, under the light of human intelligence and we might be missing a lot in terms of what animals are capable of. Many people have assumed for quite a long time that you need a large brain like a human brain with, uh, we have 100 billion neurons, to engage in, in intelligent behavior. But recent research has shown that that doesn't seem to be the case. For example, there was a recent study at Queen Mary University in London. Uh, there they found that honeybees can count up to four or five. And in addition to that, they have an abstract concept of zero, which is very surprising. Their brains are very small. They're about one cubic millimeter in size. Uh, with less than a million neurons. And they found this out because they presented bees with options of items that they could choose, different groups of items, some which had more, some which had less. And they trained them in one case to pick the group with fewer items. And then when they presented them with um, a group with no items, then those who were trained to pick fewer items chose zero. So they seem to understand that zero is less than one or more, uh, which is quite incredible. But we might find this to be incredible because, again, we're coming at uh, non-human animal intelligence expecting that uh, it takes the form of human-like intelligence. One alternative that a few of us have been proposing recently is to understand non-human animal intelligence within a framework that uh, looks at the evolution of cognition. So here the idea would be not to compare non-human animals with humans, but understand non-human animals within the broader context of evolution. And in the case of cognitive evolution, the idea is that there are major changes in the way the brain is organized and the way information is processed, and that this leads um, to the organism interacting with its environment in a dramatically different way. Some organisms like jellyfish and sponges, when you look at their nervous system, it takes the form of a network, a diffuse network that's undifferentiated and where all neurons are connected with all other neurons, or they take the form of simple structures like rings. And this is very different from other organisms like sea slugs and worms who have centralized um, nervous systems. So their neurons cluster 
and this allows for different abilities. The transitions like from network to centralization are not always an improvement. The animal is not always getting more intelligent. You'll gain the ability to integrate information um, if you're a worm compared to a sponge, uh, but you also have new limitations. So in the case of centralization, bottlenecks are introduced such that you don't engage in the type of parallel processing that an organism with a network neural system can engage in. One way of thinking about this is that in analogy with um, the periodic table of elements, so Dmitry Mendeleev developed uh, this periodic table of elements that organize the chemical elements according to their atomic number. So there's this quantitative organization of the chemical elements, but they're also qualitatively organized such that you distinguish metals which cluster together in gases. Um, and similarly, we hope that the major transitions framework would allow us to develop a way of understanding non-human animal intelligence and cognition broadly in this way. So you can categorize animals both quantitatively in terms of information processing, for example, but also qualitatively in terms of the behaviors they're capable of. One of the great benefits of understanding animal intelligence in terms of major transitions is uh, you move away from that anthropocentric or human-centric point of view where you're understanding non-human animal cognition in relation to humans at all times. So with the major transitions framework, you can look at, um, you can compare sponges and, and worms and see how their cognition differ and how their learning and problem-solving abilities differ. Uh, without bringing humans into the picture in that case. When you think of non-human animal intelligence in terms of a major transition framework, you're looking at intelligence very broadly across uh, the tree of life. And one might wonder whether we should be calling this intelligence anymore. One reason for keeping the word intelligence is it is a value-laden term in part. We use it often in a um, in the sense of giving praise or positive evaluation when we say someone is intelligent or clever. And when you adopt a kind of broader framework, then I think it might actually help us value organisms in a new way. It could both help us um, describe what animals are capable of problem solving and learning, but also uh, help us appreciate the diverse intelligences in the world. <laughs>